Do we anticipate having everybody here today? I just, it's two minutes past, so I'm going to be waiting. Give it another couple minutes and then I think we can get started. Yep. Yeah. 
I think we're getting most people now. So maybe what I will do is just go ahead and start uh, just so I don't take up too much of Josh's time for the um, for the journal club. So I am going to share my screen. And I'm going to get rid of these videos. All right. Do you all see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. We're just going to talk briefly about relative risks and odds ratios before we launch into journal club. Um, so off we go. So I'm sure you've all seen many manuscripts and you've heard about relative risks and odds ratios, but quite often people don't kind of fully understand what the difference is between the two. So basically, these are both measures of association. So how an exposure varies with an outcome. And the two by two table is like the way to examine these relationships. Now we've talked about the two by two table um, last time when, when we did these sessions. Um, and I think I mentioned then that, you know, if you know how to put these together, you can learn so much um, about your, your um, articles that you're reading or your research that you're doing. So basically you can see this kind of little scribbled one down here in the corner. Um, this is looking at exposures on the left here and um, outcomes at the top. And these are really just ways in which associations can be expressed, their ratios, um, and they're very similar, but we're gonna go into, you know, what are the differences between them? So what is a relative risk? So the relative risk is the likelihood or probability of developing a disease, given that you are exposed, okay? divided by the likelihood of developing the disease if you're not exposed, okay? So it's an incidence. That's really important to remember. Relative risk is an incidence, okay? And we're gonna come back to that as well. So this is just sort of an example of how you can calculate, you know, this is your two by two table in the box. It's important that we have our exposure um, in the sort of the top left corner for, with underneath the no exposure. And then it's important that we have our disease that we're interested in as the first one on the top row and then no disease. And it's important because the way we label these two by two tables is like this, A, B, C, and D, okay? And then you can do your totals at the, bo the, the bottom, you can do your totals along the right-hand column. So you can obviously see that's kind of self-explanatory and then an overall total, all of those cells added together. So this is kind of the fundamental part of a two by two table, but it's really, really important. And it's important that you do it in this particular order, the exposure, no exposure, the disease, no disease, okay? So to calculate the relative risk, you're basically looking, remember, at the risk of developing a disease if you were exposed. So the way we calculate that from the, um, the table is cell A over cell A plus B. So it's cell A over cell A plus B, all right? Then it's divided by the risk of developing the disease if you're not exposed. So that's cell C divided by cell C plus D, okay? So if you've set your table up right, you can keep going back and calculating relative risk. And we're going to talk about odds ratios as well. So how do you interpret the relative risk? Well, if it's one, the risk in the exposed is the same as the risk in the unexposed group. So therefore, there's no association, right? If your relative risk is higher than one, then you have a positive association. Your risk if you're exposed is higher than if you're not exposed. And then if you have a negative relative risk, mm -hmm. then potentially protective, maybe if it's a negative association. Okay. So if you just remember those kind of simple things, you can think um, about it quite easily. So here's an example in this, in this table, we've got sleep apnea over here as the exposure um, and hypertension as the disease of interest, the outcome. So we plop those numbers in for this is from a study. We plop those numbers in here. We add up the totals. And then we can go and use our relative risk formula. Remember that we've just talked about A over A plus B divided by C over C plus D. We just go back to our table. We plop in those numbers and we get 1.93 is the answer. So what that means is the risk of hypertension in the exposed group, and our exposure, remember, was OSA, is 1.93 higher than the risk of hypertension in the non-OSA group. Okay. So that 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 that's basically it. I mean, it's 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 kind of that simple. 
to calculate it. Um, now, remember, we talked about a risk of one means that each exposed group is equally likely to develop the, the disease of interest. So if you take away that equal likelihood, you'll have the increase in risk. OK, so in that prior example that we've just looked at, remember, the relative risk was 1.93. So 1.93 times higher. Or if we take away the one, because that's the equal, we're left with 0.93, which is 93 percent. So we can also interpret it as as those with OSA are 93 percent more likely to get hypertension than people uh, without OSA in our population that we studied. OK. And here's a table that just kind of does those calculations for you, right? Remember, one is equally likely, 1.5 is 1.5 times more or 50% because we take away that, that one of equality, right? And same for two and three. So three times the relative risk, three times more likely or 200% more likely. Increased risk can also be negative, of course, right? So then if it's a decreased risk. So if your increased risk is 0.7, when you take away your equally likely of one, right, which is up here in the table, you have minus 30%. So that means that the exposed group is 30% less likely to develop the disease. So again, if you if you remember these calculations in your two by two table, you can do a lot of things. So so here's a sort of a shout out to everybody. Relative risk calculations can be used in what kind of study? Remember, we said it was an incidence. Does that help? Everyone's gone quiet. Uh, prospective? Yeah. Prospective or a longitudinal study because you need to calculate incidence, right? So relative risk is used in longitudinal studies. So that's something to remember. If you're looking at longitudinal studies, you know, a lot of the studies out there use odds ratios, right? But really, they should be using relative risk. OK, so let's move on to odds ratios. So odds ratio is the odds of exposure among the disease group compared to the odds of exposure among the non-disease group. So if you think about that, we're kind of working backwards, right? Because we've already got our disease and now we want to look back and look at what the odds of the exposure were. Right. So this is like a backwards looking thing almost. Right. The odds ratio. So this is used um, in case control studies because people in case control studies are selected as cases. They're based on the disease that you're interested in and they look back at the exposure. And by that means you cannot can, um, calculate incidence. Right. Because you're looking backwards. You look you've already got your disease and you're looking back. So you cannot calculate incidence. So odds ratios are used in case control studies. OK, so we've kind of said this. So because incidence cannot be calculated, a relative risk cannot be calculated, and therefore you do the odds ratio. OK. OK, so here's an example. So an odds is not a proportion. It is the ratio of the number of ways an event can occur relative to the number of ways it cannot occur. OK, so here's your formula in the box. So for example, if four out of 10 people develop a disease, it's the proportion is 40% develop the disease, right? But we want the odds. And if we put the odds into our formula, the number with the event divided by the number without the event, it's actually four over six. So it's different from the proportion, okay? Uh, we can look at the association between the exposure and the disease. And again, we go back to our two by two table, back to our ABCD boxes, but this time, the formula is different than it was for relative risk. We've got the same table, but we use the formula a little differently, right? So we're not looking at risk of developing because that's a, um, a relative risk. We're looking at the odds of having been exposed. So in that case, our calculation is a little different. It's A over C divided by B over D, okay? So again, just another, another formula based on our two by two table. The odds ratio um, interpretation is very similar to the relative risk interpretation. So an odds of one, not related, greater than one, positively related, less than one, negatively related. Of course, we have to talk about whether it's significant or not, but that's another, that's another um, thing to think about. So here's an example. In this case, um, our exposure is gonna be alcohol abuse and our disease is gonna be bone mass, okay? 
Um, so we've plopped the fit the numbers into this table. We've done the, you know, we've added them up on the end so we know what they are. We go back to our formula, we put in the numbers and we get the answer of 4.5. So what this says is the odds of alcohol abuse are 4.5 times higher in the group with low bone mass. Okay. So sometimes these two things are actually very similar, right? Odds ratios are very, very similar to uh, relative risk. And that there's two um, situations when that happens. The first one is when the disease is rare and the duration of the disease is short. The second one is when cases and controls that you've selected are very representative of everybody with and without the disease, okay, in your population of interest, okay? In that case, they can be similar, but I'm going to show you a few examples um, of how they can be similar and how they can be different. So in this case, again, we go back to our two by two table. We put in these relevant numbers. This is an example of a disease that's infrequent. So you can see that out of 10,000 people exposed, 200 developed the disease. Out of 10,000 who were not exposed, 100 developed the disease. If you put this into the relative risk formula, you get two. If you put this into the odds ratio formula, you also get two. So there's an example of where odds approaches risk. However, there's also another example if your disease is not infrequent, so it's not rare, it's quite common. In this case, you can see that there are 100 exposed and 50 develop the disease. 100 were not exposed and 25 develop the disease. You plop these same formulas in to the relative risk, you get two. But in an odds ratio calculation, you get 2.8. So there's an example of when the odds can be different from the relative risk. And I think here's the problem in a lot of the literature is people are much more familiar with odds than they are with risk. So they calculate the odds, even if they're doing a prospective study and their odds ratio looks great. And if you have an astute reviewer or a statistical reviewer, they'll come back and say, oh, no, no, you did a prospective study. You should be calculating risk. You go back, you calculate risk and the relative risk is almost always lower than the odds. So that's just something to think about. Think about your study design and, and how they've calculated or have they done odds or risk. So you can actually do a lot with a two by two table. So the green and the pink are kind of the two by twos that we've been looking at, but this is, I'm not gonna go through this. I'm, it's just really to show you that you can, not only can you calculate odds ratios and, and risk ratios, you can also look at positive predictive value. You can look at negative predictive value. You can look at sensitivity and specificity. It's all about how you use those, those formulas, but you can get all of that um, from your two by two table. Um, so the other thing I mentioned was confidence intervals. Of course, just because you have a risk or an odds greater than one doesn't mean it's significant, right? But you need the confidence interval for that. So you don't need p-values, you need confidence. So the confidence interval is basically telling you how much uncertainty there is around your, your measure, right? Or really the precision of your estimate, okay? So we've just talked about odds. So in this case, if you had um, a study, your confidence intervals are used because you're not recruiting everybody in your population, right? You're just recruiting a part of that population. So we'll have upper and lower confidence limits. And that's how we understand that the true population effects lies somewhere between those two points. Okay, and most studies will report 95%. Um, if the confidence interval crosses one, like for example here, 0.9 to 1.1, this implies there's no difference. So you don't need a p-value. If there was a p-value there, it would be non-significant. The, um, the confidence interval either has to be always like below one for both ends of it or above one for both ends of it to be um, significant. So here's an example. The odds ratio for estrogen exposure in people with endometrial cancer is 4.4. And look at these confidence intervals. So straight away, we know that there's an increase in the odds of estrogen exposure in endometrial cancer, okay? Now we're gonna look at the odds. So the odds are 3.6 to 5.1. That's pretty tight. That's a pretty narrow, narrow band there, okay? So what that means is that we can be pretty sure that 95% of the time, the real value would lie somewhere between 3.6 and 5.1 if we did that study again and again. We got 4.4, but we might get five, we might get 3.9, but it's going to fall in that band somewhere. So a small confidence interval means you have a higher precision of your odds ratio or your relative risk, whatever you're doing. Okay. However, if we look at a different example, 
here we see the odds for estrogen exposure in endometrial cancer is 10.2. So at first glance, that's like, oh, that's a lot bigger. You know, that maybe that's a better study. But if we look at our 95% confidence intervals, we see they go from 1.2 right up to 45. So that's a big band. Okay, so the reality is 95% of the time, it could be somewhere between one and somewhere between 45. Right. So that's really not very precise. That's a wide. So, again, look at those confidence intervals. It's still significant, but it's kind of wide. Um, so we've talked about the 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 um, statistical significance. You don't need it when you've got confidence intervals. You can tell straight away if that's a, a significant value or not. And with that, I will end. Um, if there are any questions. I can take them. Um, if not, we can. We can move on and um, I can hand this over to Dr. Kramer. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. We'll share my slides here in a second. Can you guys see that okay? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you. Um, as most of you or all of you know, my name is Josh. I'm one of the sleep fellows here, and I will be doing Journal Club today. So this is the article I chose. It's the Transvenous Phrenic Nerve Stimulation Treatment of Central Sleep Apnea, Five-Year Safety and Efficacy Outcomes. So this is um, basically the study that looked at remedy, if you know that term or if you know what that is, uh, for the fellows mainly. Um, which is the phrenic nerve stimulation for central sleep apnea, as its title implies. Uh, but before we kind of get into that, I wanted to kind of address why I chose this article. Um, as many of you know, us fellows are in the interview stage right now. I know, I think most of us are at least setting them up or have gone on some interviews. And I have had really the absolute pleasure of kind of uh, wearing the University of Michigan badge uh, on my chest with with pride. Um, if if anyone knows about sleep medicine and education, um, it, it's been uh, kind of approached with a big smile and and encourage like a like a excitement and talking with me, which has been great. Uh, so props to all of our mentors here. Um, but through some of these discussions, um, they throw out, "Have you seen this? Are you familiar with this? Are you reading studies with this?" And sometimes that this was remedy. And so this didn't just come up once, but a couple of different places that I personally interviewed at, asking about neuromodulation, mainly Inspire and Remedy, and if I was comfortable with it, if I've been reading studies with it, and then they usually followed up with telling me how many roughly patients they have with either of these devices um, and so forth. So um, I, I kind of left these meetings. I don't think it was necessarily a negative aspect of my interview per se, um, but I left feeling like, hey, I, I, this is an area of my training so far that I feel like is weak or needs a little bit more improvement. So I thought, what a better way to kind of dive in and kind of learn this material through a journal club. So what is Remedy? Let's start with that. This is actually a picture from one of their uh, papers itself. Uh, but it is a similar battery pack um, implanted in the chest, just like Inspire. However, this whole procedure is done intravenously, as the name implies. Um, so you can kind of see, I don't know if you can actually see my cursor or not on my screen, but you can actually see them gain access into the venous system. They, they place a lead down other veins that run contiguously next to the phrenic nerve. So this will be the left side, this will be the right side. And they actually stimulate the nerve from the vein. Um, so there's not actual surgery that attaches a nerve generator or, or rather the nerve stimulator to the nerve directly but rather uh, stimulating it from the vein since it's running so close to the uh, nerve itself. They kind of stimulate the diaphragm to contract, to mimic uh, the, the breathing motion to help with central sleep apnea. Uh, so that's just a, my own quick little snippet of it, but um, now we can kind of dive in more to the specifics. And before we can talk about the five-year safety data, we have to kind of reference the, the main control trial where this kind of all got started. So this is one of the papers that was published around that time that was published in Lancet uh, that highlights this, what they call the pivotal trial for Remedy. So I'm going to briefly talk about this. We actually get to the actual paper that we're going to cover for Journal Club. But 
<clears throat> this pay, uh, th this uh, control trial was conducted over different countries in Europe and the U.S. Uh, it was a multi-center uh, randomized control trial, and there were a total of 151 patients enrolled in the study. In order to be enrolled, you had to have an AHI of at least 20, where most of those uh, were central apneas. They had to have at least 30 central apneas in the night of that diagnostic study. And then uh, the obstructive apnea index had to be 20% or lower. And then each one of these patients were randomized into a stimulation group or a non-stimulation group. So everyone got the device placed, but they only turned on the stimulation for half this group, and that would be the treatment group. So this is the breakdown of the demographics between the group two groups. I'll let you quick look at that. They felt like this was pretty um, well distributed between the control and treatment groups. Um, I don't know if any of you had any thoughts on this patient population, uh, if you felt like that was accurate or not. Um, you can kind of feel free to jump in if you did. The, thing, the big take homes that I took from this were um, most of these were white guys um, in this study um, as far as demographics go. And then the big thing I was looking for was, was there a good chunk of patients with heart failure as we see a lot of central sleep apnea with heart failure patients? And out of the pooled analysis, you can see a total of 64 patients, which worked up to about 42% of these patients did have heart failure. You can even see their kind of average ejection fraction there. And then they even broke it down to um, their different classes of heart failure. Of note, they did um, exclude patients with severe heart failure or stage four or stage D heart failure. They also excluded central sleep apnea that was related to opioids. Uh, so those patients were not enrolled in the study. The primary endpoints of this pivotal trial was we were trying to achieve at least a 50% reduction of AHI at six months, which they felt like was a good time to kind of titrate up the stimulation of the device itself to get to a therapeutic range. And then they also wanted to look at the safety of this device at a year. So this is their main table of data. So I'll kind of go through this quickly because it's kind of messy, but I highlighted there that you can see that 35, uh, 35 patients or 51% of the patients in the treatment group did have at least a 50% reduction, which was their main primary endpoint there. But they also wanted to highlight a couple other things that they noticed re regarding their sleep um, and sleep architecture. Um, so here's the central apnea index. You can see that reduction from 31 to six. Um, here is the... Uh, the AHI, which the, once again fell um, uh, right around that 50% mark. The arousal index was also lowered uh, significantly. The percent of um, REM sleep had also improved um, at, when they compared these two as far as their sleep architecture goes. They also did a global um, assessment for patients um, regarding kind of like their um, like their quality of care, like or, or not quality of care, but their overall impression of their quality of life. And they had positive uh, signs of that. And I have a, a slide on the next slide that kind of, I think depicts that a little better. Their oxygen desaturations of 4% or greater also went down. They had less severe large events. And their F worst sleepiness score was something else I highlighted. We're already at six months. They had a three point drop of this score. And this was also significant. So here's the slide I like because it's in a picture form. On the left is the percentage of uh, change in AHI, and the top bar is the treatment group, and the bottom bar is the control group. So the first thing I notice is right away when you look at the control group, you see it's like kind of 50-50. Some patients got a little better, some patients got a little worse, but overall it was kind of a wash, and that makes sense because these were not the patients in the treatment group. However, the, the bar above that, you see predominantly green bars which is signifying an improvement in their AHI with uh, stimulation. And then if you look and kind of 
bring your eye from the 50% mark all the way over here, you're roughly halfway through, which is their goal is to improve the HI by 50%. On the right-hand side, this is that, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, patient global assessment. So they were saying, as far as their kind of quality of life, have there been an overall improvement in their life? And that dotted line is, is basically saying anything below that dotted line is saying that there was either no change or their, their life has gotten worse from this. And in the treatment group, you can see that the vast majority of people are at least saying that there's been some positive aspects in their global assessment of life since this procedure, where most of the patients in the non-treatment group were saying that there's been no change or even worse change after the procedure. So the overall results of the study, 51% did reach that at least 50% reduction on their AHI at six months. And 91% of the patients had no serious adverse events at 12 months. So they're saying that this is indeed a safe procedure. So at the conclusion of this, this interpretation was literally taken out of the paper. And it kind of just states that making, you know, taking into account this data the transvenous neurosimulation is a promising therapeutic approach for central sleep apnea. And when they presented this to the FDA, Remedy was actually approved in the FDA in 2017. However, it was a conditional approval. Um, and the FDA did say, hey, we wanna do some additional safety data collection to make sure this is uh, there's some long-term safety measures met. And also they wanna make sure it continues to work. Um, so the next paper that we'll talk about is this study, which they call the PASS study or the post-approval study. So here it is once again, the five-year safety and efficacy outcomes. So the beginning of this paper, they once again highlight why they're doing this. So this is also reporting uh, this in five-year analysis. And to kind of uh, jump ahead, they did say, hey, based on this paper, we uh, the FDA has concluded uh, that we have fulfilled the post-approval requirement. Um, so let's go ahead and jump into this. So the methods of this trial were that all the patients that were active at the time of the FDA approval in the pivotal trial were identified as patients that could enroll in the pass. And the patients had to have completed at least two years of follow-up in the pivotal trial and had to complete um, therapy through the five years of the past trial in order to be included. They got polysomnograms at their baseline already from the pivotal trial, but also at year one, two, and five. And then they used home sleep apnea testing with the Knox device at year three. Um, granted, this time frame did take place during COVID, and so that was maybe one of the limitations of this. And occasionally patients, even at the five-year mark, had to have um, a home sleep apnea test because of the COVID restrictions. And of note, the same central uh, sleep core laboratory that scored um, all the polysomnograms were also used in this trial. And then the same independent clinical events committee that determined safety of the first trial were also used again in this trial. So the same folks are, are doing the scoring uh, and uh, the evaluation of the safety measures. So here's a breakdown of this, and I'm curious to know what you guys thought of, I guess, the overall methods of the study, and I'll kind of leave this up if people want to chime in, because uh, some things kind of stuck out to me, and I'll kind of highlight that in a second. But did anyone want to share, if they're able to, um, what their overall thoughts of those methods um, were? I think, you know, uh, there was 151 patients that significant of them dropped out, you know, when they come to five years. So that's only one third of the patient remained on that study at the end. Yeah, thank you. That was the biggest take on mine too. I was like, where are all the patients go? Even initially, I'm like, why, why is there only 94? But thinking back through the pivotal trial, the first patients that enrolled likely completed the trial, um, you know, the six month file and the year follow up. And so weren't labeled as still active um, at the time the FDA had approved it. So likely were kind of they didn't call those patients back and say, hey, do you want to be a part of this? They were 
only the patients that were still active in the trial, which I think maybe was a limitation to some of the numbers. Uh, but I completely agree with you. That was my biggest take, take home too. So then I thought, well, if they lost all these people um, from the first trial, is this same? Um, are these the same demographics? And so here they actually thought that same thing too. And so this uh, demographics table shows the demographics from the pivotal trial with an N of 151. Uh, and then also comparing it with this study out of the 53 folks that were enrolled in this study. And for the most part, I agree with them. I think for the most part, it is pretty similar. Um, so maybe we got lucky with that as those folks dropped off. Um, but uh, but they did include that in the paper, which I thought was good to at least um, kind of answer that question. So once again, the uh, use of the oh sorry. Go ahead, Dr. I was Dr. gonna I was gonna say I think the use of home sleep apnea testing because the Nox T3 is a the home it's a type three device, right? I think that's an interesting choice in a population with central sleep apnea. I don't think that's consistent with what we do. Uh, typically, I understand some of the barriers with co the COVID pandemic, but um, that that strikes me too. Yeah, as part of the methodology. Thank you. Yeah, I quick Googled it because I wasn't familiar with that name. And it, I, and maybe Dr. Kaplish, if he's on, I did notice that there are two bands. I think with this one as they kind of wrap it around. So I don't know if that's better at evaluating because you actually have two respiratory belts uh, to give you some more data. Uh, but obviously, um, some limitations of doing a home study, and they were trying. They're going to show that they're trying to show some um, results on sleep architecture, which obviously we don't have that without the EEG. Uh, so definitely limiting ourselves with that. Additionally, there's a lot of folks that just didn't want to enroll, or they did mention resource issues at some of these sites. So, a 17 patients uh, did not enroll because of site resource issues as well. So, um, so. All in all, I don't know if that is another plug because of COVID or uh, the home sleep apnea test. They didn't really specify that, but Dr. Kalish, I did see your hands up. Yeah, um, I think some of our um, research does use a notch um, uh, in their studies at home, um, but I, some of the notch uh, uh, models, I think are able to do full PSGs at home with the uh, two models. So I think there's a potential there. I don't know what exactly model that they use and whether that has the potential of correct, correct um, recording EEG, which I think is possible. So maybe that's what or the reason why their choice was. Yeah, I agree. I think they specified the T3 though, which is a type three. So it wasn't clear to me that what they used was, you know, it, uh, EEG was with EEG or was a full PSG. It didn't sound like it, but the T3 does not have EEG. It's it's similar to our Alice, but it does have two plethysmography belts. They're not just inductance. Uh, they're not just um, uh, you know, they're they're good quality belts. And so the people who have when you have choices of different machines, the T3 gets pretty high ratings. Um, but uh, does that mean it necessarily replicates the PSG so well? I don't know that that's true. And the, the, if you do want to use the full polysomography, that's um, the Knox A1. Um, and uh, then you also have to look into the details there too, because um, uh, some, they promote its use with just an array of frontal electrodes that includes two of the Ray standard leads and then others that are just kind of invented, uh, not like the manual. So sticky no matter what you pursue. Awesome. Thank you guys. That was great. Okay. So here is the main data uh, table from this study. And as you may notice, it looks very similar to the pivotal trial. So I'm going to kind of draw your eyes to the same things that at least my eyes kind of were drawn to. So primarily we're looking now at the five-year data compared to uh, some of the data from before. Uh, so it's mainly this table here where you can kind of see these different things. But once again, they highlight the same thing. There's There was a reduction in the apnea hypopnea index. Their baseline of 46, it's now come down to 17. The central apnea index went down from 23 down to one. Um, oxygen desaturation at at least 4% went down from 39 to 15. The arousal index fell 
And the sleep architecture of the data that we did have, as you can see, the three-year data isn't there because we did home sleep apnea tests for those. Uh, but they they go to show that by using this device, there's a reduction in N1 sleep and an, and an increase in N2 and REM sleep, which they kind of label as like deep sleep. Um, I would think of it maybe as a little bit more, um, you know, less sleep fragmentation or a little bit more uh, 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 kind of sustained sleep. Um, and then lastly, the upward sleepiness scale continued to show at that three uh, point reduction, even at five years, um, kind of throughout the this uh, study. Once again, they threw a little bit more colorful visual graphs in here, which I appreciate. Um, and the first part is once again, the, the reduction of the different types of events. So the main color that they're highlighting here is that yellow color. Uh, you can see the baseline yellow compared to, you know, even at one year it drops significantly. Um, and then the, on the, the bars on the right are paired patients. So these are the same folks that finished this past trial, what their actual baseline is and comparing those two direct studies. And you can see that reduction in the central apnea uh, index there. This is for um, the stages of sleep. Once again, focusing on the yellow, which is the N1, you can kind of see that stepwise reduction. It seems to kind of decrease as you use it more, as time goes on. And the blue bars and the green bars uh, seem to be getting larger compared to that baseline um, uh, bar or segment. And then once again, they have the paired patients on the right, and you can clearly see that there is a reduction in the N, which is the N1, I'm sorry, the yellow, which is the N1, and then the blue and green are larger compared to the baseline. What are your overall thoughts of how they reported daytime sleepiness and this three-point drop? Did people think that, were they impressed or not so impressed? Yeah, Dr. Chalkar. Um, yeah, I mean, as a clinician, I don't know really what to do with a change from nine to six. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know that that's clean, clinically meaningful. Uh, and so I, I wasn't super impressed with that. Thank you. Dr. Chervin? Um, well, I agree with what Anita said. But on the other hand, if you look at trial, at studies with obstructive sleep apnea, when you treat obstructive sleep apnea, what kind of improvement on the Epworth do you think you get on average? Just about three. So it's not, I don't think it's uncommon to get that in, in a large number of people. So, nice. yeah, so I, I don't, I, it's, yeah, it's, I agree, it's, it's but something. I think within the realm of, you know, uh, yeah. Going from above 10 to below 10, I think that change is, to me is more meaningful than below 10 to further below 10. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'll remind you guys is that when they looked um, in the uh, sleep heart health study and, um, you know, classified people and looked at the top quartile of um, sleep apnea and the bottom quartile of sleep apnea and looked at in those two groups, what's the difference in the app worth? It was about two points. Yes. Dr. Kaplish, see your hand is up. I had a very similar response to what Ron said. Even oh, the gotcha. last guidelines with the PAP therapy that came out that also had a threshold of two point difference from the PAP to non -BAP. Um, So, um, But I point from Anita is well taken on this. But I, I, the, the, the biggest question I, had, I was trying to ask myself is, these patients who have bad heart disease uh, and a lot of heart failure, is f really validated Tool to assess their sleepiness, maybe. Um, so I, I'm, so that is, I don't know what the right tool would be in this subset of population, but is that something that's valid? Maybe the threshold needs to be different, and I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, interesting. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. I, I did appreciate that the paper did highlight those patients that did have initial Epworth greater than 10, and you can see that they were actually more likely compared to the other folks to have a more significant drop. So out of that three, per, three uh, point change, 88% um, of them had at least a three point drop if their baseline upwork was above 10. 
which I did think was um, interesting. So the more sleepy you are, maybe the more likely you are to have a bigger um, drop in your EPWA score by this form of treatment. The safety measures uh, showed that 14% of subjects through the five years uh, did um, go through some um, safety adverse event. Um, no related cocaminant uh, um, cardiac device uh, interactions occurred. There was one patient in the pivotal trial who, uh, because of the neurostimulation, actually had their defibrillator go off. And they said that with reprogramming, that never happened again. Uh, but that seemed to only occur kind of initially and nothing after two years. And no deaths occurred during the past time. Um, this is just kind of a big uh, table um, showing these safety outcomes. You can kind of see all the different possibilities of adverse events that can happen. I think some of these are pretty common when it comes to neurostimulation. I'm, I mainly was thinking too of like deep brain stimulation and I know how we always checked impedances and we'd have to talk to our neurosurgeon sometimes if there was a high impedance and then the battery packs, you know, obviously it's a surgery and there's a risk for infection. So th these are some of the things that kind of stuck out to me as, as kind of obvious, I guess, for any sort of neuromodulation that's being done. In this study in particular, they did highlight a couple of patients who just kind of had it bad, unfortunately. Um, so they said one subject experienced the fall and because of the fall, it dislocated the lead and they needed multiple procedures in the hospital to extract the lead and place a new lead, which then subsequently dislodged again, requiring further replacement. And so his adverse events, there's a couple of them on here from like that one case. So some of these also occurred in uh, the same patient. Um, and another thing besides the things I've already mentioned during this section of the paper, they did talk about the battery longevity, um, which I was actually a little bit surprised about, uh, but I guess it makes sense. Once again, comparing some of my patients I've had in Parkinson's clinics uh, with their deep brain stimulator and being able to tell them like, hey, they might go 10 years without needing a battery pack or something along those lines. The battery longevity that they reported in this study, it kind of differed depending on what nerve they were stimulating. Um, so 47 months for a left stimulation lead and 35 months for a right stimulation lead. Um, so combined estimate of about 41 months if you're going to tell patients, um, you know, roughly what people are looking at. So not too many years and they're needing to undergo another surgery for a new battery pack, essentially, to have that, that battery pack replaced. Once again, putting them at a higher risk of potentially developing some of these uh, adverse events. And some of these adverse events did occur when they were getting their, their, um, their battery pack changed, like on the second surgery itself. The paper then did try to highlight uh, a little subgroup analysis where they looked specifically at patients with heart failure versus not heart failure. Um, this is, I tried to like chop off the main uh, change from baseline data and kind of try to combine them for you. Um, because overall, I feel like they kind of show similar results. Uh, there might be a slighter, greater reduction in AHI in the heart failure group um, and a greater change in the, the ODI or the oxygen desaturation index and the upward sleepiness score in the non-heart failure group. But I don't know if you guys felt like there was that big of a difference uh, between the two groups. Um, I kind of felt like they were pretty similar. So uh, the paper does talk about some limitations. We've already talked about some already with like the, like the low N or the low amount of patients that were enrolled in this study. But did anyone have any other concerns or limitations from this study that they felt like maybe weren't highlighted in the paper or they wanted to mention? I don't know whether, I don't see that in the graphs at least, um, whether there was any comment on whether CSA with chain strokes aspiration 
who are, had better results or non-chain source aspiration had better results. Uh, did, did you see anything? Uh, so I just don't know whether they should have done that. Yeah, no, I don't think they did. I agree with you. I don't think they did. Um, because I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think some of the other central sleep apnea studies have looked at that, um, or at least differentiated that, but I don't think in this paper they, they did in the data set. So here were some of the things that the paper outlined or that I thought of myself um, as far as some limitations. Um, but in uh, one of them being that, you know, not all the centers participated in this for X, Y, or Z reasons, and that may underestimate the adverse events. So that was an interesting way. I, I didn't think of that one, but that was labeled in the paper. Um, but, uh, but yeah, these were some of the other ones. Dr. Hassan, do you have a question or want to say something? Um, actually, just the limitations, Josh. I mean, how generalizable is this population to the population that is seen? They chose the, I think, the perfect population to study with really low OSA, like the numbers were low, a male, white, thin group. But how many of those patients would we get in a year? Like, right? Yeah. Maybe one, if at all. Um, but one of the things that we see with phrenic nerve pacing, just you have to get it perfectly right. Otherwise, you veer on the side of OSA. And then when we're looking at, when you're pulling up the graph, um, it still showed a, a significant amount of time um, with like oxygen desaturation it improved and the percent of time below with oxygen. Um, yeah. So if you look at it, it's it wasn't statistically significant. So yes, they showed the AHI and all of these things improve, but percent of sleep time with oxygen saturation not statistically significant. Uh, minutes of time with oxygen saturation less than ninety. Some improvement, but still it was still there. So when when we think of this patient population, I mean those are pretty key. Um, indicators that this is not all rainbows and unicorn as a therapy device, which I think this is why we decided not to start here. Neeraj and I had been in multiple uh, meetings. What was, what was it, Neeraj, like uh, four years back with, with, the, um, with the remedy people? But it was the studies were conducted in this ideal patient population. The improvement was like kind of may. Um, and I don't know how, like which patient population we get, like maybe one patient a year for this. And then when you try and crank up the settings, um, then you run the risk of OSA. Granted that it's only unilateral phrenic nerve pacing, but that's the risk you run into with phrenic nerve pacing. Yeah, thanks so much for that. No, I think that's important to think about, obviously, how do we generalize this? And I do think, they they kind of, I guess, uh, flexed a little bit in the paper saying that they used more severe central sleep apnea in this group and still showed these results. Um, but I agree with you, not near as common of patients. Um, but I think in the few maybe that I have seen that might fit in this category, I feel like sometimes PAP treatment became difficult to treat. And so, you know, um, maybe, maybe, I don't know what the number, but maybe this could be an option in those select few, one patient a year or whatever, um, but maybe not enough to actually conduct here. I don't know. Um, thanks for that. So I think uh, looking at this data, even if you take the data for um, at the face value, we should not, we probably would be using when the central apnea index, not central hypopnea index, uh, is more relevant. So they are, is that a patient that is going to be even more a smaller niche in that population? Um, because if you have just have central apnea, then those are in, and those are very prominent. That is a patient that you might potentially would want to just feeding the strict criteria, not the overall AHI, I guess, at that point. Mm -hmm. And also, if the phrenic nerve uh, is stimulated, there will be some activity in the diaphragm. Does that make the central apnea on their 
outcome study go away primarily as a function of diaphragm moving. And now they cannot score centrals, so their index is going to improve. And that is the point that I think Fadi was making that the oxygen saturations may not have improved, but the overall EHI improved because the central apneas could not be scored because now there is diaphragmatic activity from the scoring perspective. Yeah, interesting. I know they, they made a comment about uh, that in the PSG, they weren't able to see stimulation or not because the people that scored the studies were blinded. So the, the physicians taking care of the patients were not blinded, obviously, if they're like manipulating their, their treatment settings. But the people reading the sleep studies were apparently blinded to whether or not they were actually getting therapy or not. But I'd be curious to know, like, I think to your point, Dr. Kalish, is there subtle changes in like the breathing pattern that you can kind of tell and say, oh, that one's probably, even though I don't see like a burst um, or something like a like an artifact from a stimulation, maybe I can still tell to some degree. Um, it's interesting. So the conclusions of this paper were that at five years, it does suggest that this is a safe and effective therapy. Um, we've already kind of been doing this, but overall, um, I was hoping to kind of talk about what your guys' impressions were on this. Um, if you thought it was a good study, a bad study, is it, does it make you think about any patients that you currently have thinking, man, they could really maybe benefit from something like this? Or, um, you know, if we offered something like this, I probably would have referred a patient or two to have this done. Um, I'm just kind of curious from our staff perspective, since we don't do this, if you feel like you have patients in your population that um, you would have looked into this for. I think they mentioned that, you know, the survival from from these heart failure patients was more than 75% of these patients and also reduced the hospitalization. Correct. Yeah, so that was something else they were kind of proud of, that the survival rates for this study, I think, were 78% in the entire population and then 68% in the heart failure group. And in comparing like the CERV-HF trial, um, I think the survival rate was approximately 60% in the control group and 55 in the ASV arm. Um, so, so yeah, so that was something that they were kind of wondering, is that, uh, is that showing us anything? Cool. Well, I, it's, it's interesting, and I, I think we probably all could think of a patient or two, you know, over a year or two that we might consider for this. Okay. Um, and, you know, I'll point out that what's the, what's the destiny of people that we see with central sleep apnea when we do treat them in a more standard manner? You know, and I would say just, I mean, I'd be curious what other people's experience are, but, you know, we had one in the last two weeks with a fellow, I think. I mean, the, when they come back and you look at, if they're on a machine and you look at what's residual, those will be the ones with the, that aren't as cleanly treated as the obstructive sleep apnea patients. You know, and they, they might end up with, an, you know, an estimated, machine estimated uh, rate of an AHI of five to 10, you know, you don't necessarily get them to zero. Um, so I, th I think it's interesting. I, I, obviously, we don't know enough about it in part because we're not doing too much of it here, but also we probably need more data on it before we would just present it with total confidence to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I had a question. What, why do you think, you know, when we do see central sleep apnea, and I'm not, you know, not the, just the phasic kind in REM, it's usually a non-REM, it's usually metabolically mediated. Um, why did, the REM sleep improved when the central sleep apnea was treated. I think um, the way I, I guess read into that was they thought they were getting more consolidated sleep by keeping the arousals low. And so now their body was naturally able to maybe hit more REM cycles. Um, that's how I think I interpreted that, but I don't know for sure. Yeah. I wondered about that, but you say, you know, you treat the non-REM better, you make more room for the REM maybe, but mm -hmm. it still seems a little, I'm not, I'm not sure I know the answer. Yes, thank you. So of note, they are collecting data still. Um, there's this kind of post-market study that's out there in Europe and the U.S. 
where they're trying to enroll at least 500 patients to look at more of the safety data. And then of note, I did go on their website and kind of look. So th this is a quick snapshot. It didn't let me include the entire US. It had like a limitation on the, on the distance. But these are all the centers where there's some electrophysiologist that's performing this study or this procedure rather. So they are kind of sprayed all around the US where people can have this done. And we might come into this if we get into a sleep center on these areas where all of a sudden we're kind of seeing a patient in clinic that might have these things. And, and once again, this is from their website, but this is something patients can look up. So I, not this isn't just from the study that we just talked about, but from kind of collectively, you know, 78% of the patients report an improvement in their quality of life or their patient global assessment. And 95% of the patients said they would do it again if they could, which I feel like is a is pretty high number. And I feel like we also see that with Inspire patients, even when they're complaining, they're pretty happy that they went and undergone that and they maybe got hang up the path and, you know, they're feeling better. And then once again, if, if the patient's really struggling with sleepiness, this is something that they're advertising as being pretty impressive from this device's uh, data. So once again, we kind of already talked on this, but these are my thoughts on Remedy as we're kind of running out of time here. Um, but as I mentioned before, it's not as common, definitely kind of pointed that out uh, before, but maybe, maybe for some of these more difficult patients, this could be utilized in some of these uh, patients. And I feel like neurostimulation is becoming more popular across the board. Um, and so we might be running into more studies that are similar to this or similar ideas that we should be comfortable kind of looking at the data and, and analyzing. Um, that remedy, it, it seems like there was some decent data showing some of these reductions and things in quality and life improvement. And then once again, as a trainee, uh, I appreciate being able to discuss this with you guys and just from my own education. Um, so I can kind of feel more, uh, you know, uh, aware um, going forward with things. And that's it. Great. Thanks, Josh. Just one thing just to point out that um, when I looked at who funded this study, it was Respicardia. And if you look at the author list, you can see that quite a lot of those authors got grants or personal fees from Respicardia. And there was actually a couple of employees of Respicardia on that author list. So I did go back and look at the statistical section because I wanted to know, you know, did the employees do the stats? And it, it actually doesn't say. So that was just something I was like, hmm, <laughs> that's a lot of Respicardia people on that author list, but just to kind of point that out for, you know, future things when you're looking at these things, just take a quick look at, um, you know, those disclosures. So yeah, great, great job. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, great article that you selected. Yeah, good job, Josh. All right, thank you everybody. Have a good day.